welcome to the After On Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Reed, and this is a series of conversations with thinkers, founders, and scientists. Take a little time and stretch out, because these talks are unhurried and meant to bring you to a top percentile understanding of something important. So, whether you're into startups or ideas, a techie or a lit major, take your time, engage your mind, and you'll be glad you did it. Especially this week, when we'll be talking to... Andrew Yoon, a young American entrepreneur who's built an organization with remarkable speed that's simply vast by the standards of tech and life science startups. It's not based in San Francisco, Austin, or any other tech hub. Because Andrew's not making a restaurant hunting app or a microblog. He's instead trying to transform the food security of some of the poorest people on our planet. And his organization's scalability and capital efficiency would be the envy of many of tech's greatest startups. It's called the One Acre Fund, and it's based in Rubengura, Rwanda, a small provincial town that's halfway across the country from the capital city of Kigali. Andrew certainly isn't the first founder to appear on this show. Still, this is an unusual episode in that neither science nor technology sit at the center of his creation. But Andrew's work is still at least as important as that of any entrepreneur. And I believe our conversation will fascinate you. So hopefully you'll enjoy this partial hiatus from my show's normal obsessions. Before I tell you more about Andrew and One Acre Fund, I'd like to share an update on a few activities of mine, which are related to this show, yet independent of it. First, I'm hugely excited to tell you I'm working on a fairly ambitious article for the Sunday New York Times magazine. Getting this assignment resulted directly from an episode I ran earlier this year, but no spoilers, so I won't tell you which one just yet. Writing this piece is exposing me to dozens of brilliant neuroscientists, physicists, surgeons, and others, which is quite a departure for me. Of course, each episode of this podcast gets me interfacing deeply with a brilliant mind, whereas writing this article is more like a buffet of brilliance, which is its own kind of awesome. Some future episodes of the podcast may well stem from the relationships I'm forming from this work, and I might also share some of the interviews I'm doing for this article with you, maybe as Patreon extras, maybe as short bonus episodes of the main show. We'll see. These interviews tend to be much briefer, less formal, and way less structured than what I normally produce, but they're still damn fascinating. So if the New York Times is okay with it, maybe I'll be bringing some of them to you. In other news, for those of you who listened to the long essay I read in my Patreon feed back on June 30th, I'm deep in the process of rewriting the bejesus out of it. It's slated to run in three installments over three consecutive weeks in October. For now, I won't mention the publication, but it's one pretty much all of you are familiar with. The original essay featured some uncharacteristically cautious notes about science and technology, to put it mildly, from someone who tends to be relentlessly optimistic about these things. But I do fear that along with the vast promise inherent in the things we explore in this show, huge perils also lurk in the shadows, and these essays will explore that duality. When they run in October, I'm going to produce at least one and maybe two podcast episodes, which will be complementary to them. I'm thrilled to tell you now that one of my interviewees will be Great Britain's astronomer royal, Martin Rees. He writes books all too rarely for my tastes, given that I'm a huge fan of his. His last major work for non-scientific readers dates clear back to 2003. It focuses on global catastrophic risks and contains countless ideas that utterly fascinated me when I first read them, and also scared the living crap out of me. So I'm truly honored that Martin Rees will be joining us on this show in October, and I'm delighted to add that his next major book will also appear in October. It's about time, Sir Martin. One last thing before we dive into my conversation with Andrew Yoon about the One Acre Fund, it's a recommendation I'd like to make to anyone who's seeking a podcast to add to their diet. It's called Tech Dirt. And while that may sound like a Silicon Valley gossip rag, both the podcast and the news site of the same name are intensely serious and brainy. TechDirt's name is a relic of a playful joke that its founder, Mike Masnick, made back in college. Then suddenly his blog took off and almost instantly became one of the great independent voices of the Web 2.0 revolution. And its influence has never ceased to grow. Personally, as the host of a podcast whose title doesn't make a ton of obvious sense on the surface, I can relate. Mike's work is deeply concerned with issues of free speech, anonymity, privacy, and intellectual property. 
In this era of virulent fake news and underhanded government intrusion, this agenda is more important than ever. I find Mike to be an exceptionally thoughtful yet gentle host, and this combination elicits incredible conversations with his guests. As a gateway drug, I strongly recommend his episode from January 30th of this year, which is kind of a big-picture exploration of free speech and the marketplace of ideas. It's a fun and intensely provocative conversation between Mike and Nabi Hassayed, who recently published a brilliant piece on this topic in the Yale Law Journal. A second, very different episode I'll also recommend ran on June 12th. It's a rollicking, smart, and often very funny debate about the e-scooters that have cluttered the sidewalks of tech-forward cities like Santa Monica and, until recently, San Francisco. If you don't live in one of these places, e-scooters are coming soon to a sidewalk near you. And both their ramifications and the business models behind them are way more fascinating than I expected before listening to that episode. Finally, as always, I'd like to ask you to consider supporting my work on Patreon with a sum of as little as a dollar per month. I'll talk more about Patreon and the very unusual piece of bonus content that my Patreon supporters are receiving this week after the interview. I'd meanwhile like to implore each of you to please spread the word about this podcast. It's true lifeblood, if it ever has one. We'll be in an audience that's big enough to attract high-quality advertisers that I can speak on behalf of in good conscience. And we're almost there. We may actually have our first ad as soon as next month. Exciting, right? But it's not a sure thing. So please tweet about the show, talk it up on Facebook, in person, via email, however you choose. And of course, the simplest thing of all would be to rate the show in iTunes or in Apple's podcasts app. Dozens of people used to do this every week, but far fewer recently, and it's breaking my little podcasting heart. So if you're either disinclined or just not in a position to spread the word about the show or support it financially, I totally understand and fully appreciate the time you put into listening, but I'd also appreciate a few quick seconds to rate this show and or a few more seconds if you'd also like to write a review. This will help other folks hear about this show because Apple's ingenious but mysterious promotional algorithms pay very close attention to this. And now I'm delighted to present my conversation with an extraordinary person who's doing vast amounts of good in this world, Andrew Yoon. Andrew, thank you so much for coming clear up to San Francisco. I know you've got a busy several days, a couple of weeks actually here in the Bay Area, but I know the sound quality of my living room so well. So it's very kind of you to come up to the closest thing I have to a recording studio. Thank you. Well, I'm very impressed with your get up here. This is pretty cool. So I thought we'd start just with a quick overview of your background, that which went before One Acre Fund. You grew up in Minnesota, right? That's right. In St. Paul area. Mm -hmm. And your early adulthood parallels my own very closely. And I would say that it looked very pre-yuppie because my early adulthood certainly was when you went to Yale. You worked in management consulting, which is famous as a feeder for business schools. Then you went to business school. You went to Northwestern, right? Yep. And anybody looking from the outside would say, wow, this guy is on his way to maybe a career in management consulting. Perhaps he's going to take a crazy turn and go to Wall Street. But you ended up the social sector. Right, absolutely. I think just like many people on the uh, pre-yuppie path, as you describe it, we're fascinated and we love business concepts business concepts of scale and how to grow an organization and how to lead an organization. At the same time, my passion lies in ending poverty. That's something that goes back many years for you. Yeah, it's always been there for me. And in the same way that another person applies their passion in a completely different way for human health, for example, or other areas. So for me, yeah, I was very interested in developing that toolkit around business, but then applying it in a different direction. And Business school was kind of an odd place to discover that, but has really put all the pieces together. Well, you, it sounds like you pre-discovered it as well. I mean, did you start thinking about poverty and how to end it as a child? My parents have always instilled that in me. And I think what surprised me was that I was really interested in poverty domestically, which still is very important and dear to me. But I went to business school originally to try to get closer to Minnesota, and it ended up sending me to sub-Saharan Africa. Which on a solar system-wide scale is rather close to Minnesota, but on a global <laughs> scale, it's kind of the opposite direction. We talked earlier, and I think I recall you saying the thing that surprised you was not that you went into the social sector, that was always the plan, but that it became international. So there was a transformative trip to Africa. 
what was it going into your second year of business school? Yes, between my first and second years, I did a summer internship in Africa, which I've never been to before. And I had this transformative experience. At the end of it, I traveled randomly in Kenya for a couple of weeks and met two families that really changed the course of my life forever. In rural Kenya? Yes. And what was it about those two families that was so transformative? The first family I met, the mother's name was Christine. She was a farmer and she was just desperately poor. Her children regularly skipped meals. She had lost a child. And I remember just being so moved by the desperate poverty of this family. But thankfully, the next family that I met, the mother's name was Betty, and she was yielding four times as much food on the same unit of land. In a similar climate, a similar town? or Absolutely. They were neighbors. They were neighbors, and they had the same amount, what, about an acre? Yes, about one acre of land, about the size of a football field. And her family was thriving because of her increased harvest. Four her times totally the different. yield. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. That is extreme. And what turned out to be the difference? Exactly. Just like any curious person, I was just asking Betty a bunch of questions. And after an hour of asking her questions, we only identified three things that were different. So first, she bought professional agricultural seed, which is produced naturally by local companies. It's hybrid seed, not GMO seed. Mm -hmm, yeah. Exactly. And her neighbor did not. Nope. Next, she used a tiny micro dose of conventional fertilizer for each plant. And what would be a normal thing to do? Not use fertilizer or to use more fertilizer? Uh, not to use any fertilizer at all. Because that stuff is expensive, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But she was putting like a thimble on each seed or something like that. Exactly. Like actually less than a thimble full for a plant that's taller than we are. And you know, a lot of people say, oh, fertilizer is bad. But actually, if you think about it from a climate perspective, the only alternative to producing more food on the same unit of land is to clear a lot more land. Yeah. So I think it's a pretty good trade-off to make your existing land a lot more productive. As opposed to like chopping down more forests and so forth. If you're going to expand your yields by double or even triple digit percentages, that's a big ROI for that fertilizer. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. It's also in a context where there's very little animal manures and people have to cultivate every spare piece of land that they have. In the context where there's not much land available and also where there's not much animals provide nutrients for the soil, using a tiny microdose of fertilizer is actually a pretty good environmental trade-off. And then what was the third thing? The last thing was she just spaced her seeds and engaged in some other simple planting practices as opposed to just scattering her seeds somewhat randomly. And I just asked her all these questions and it was just these three simple things. And later on, I came to realize that the world's poor spend about a billion hours a day farming Collectively, a billion hours a day. Yeah, using bad practices and lacking these basic and simple tools and making really small tweaks in that farming can make them a lot more productive and completely change the course of entire families' lives. So let's talk about the very, very big picture. To go back to business school speak briefly, your target market is 50 million sub-Saharan households, correct? Mm -hmm. What percentage of Africa's poor lives in those households? And then going up another level, what percentage of the global poorest poor live in smallholder farming families? So the statistics are relatively uniform, but roughly 70% of Africa or the world's poor are farmers. And so you think about what incredible opportunity that is, like most of the world's poor people have just one profession. It's a remarkably uniform type of situation. They share a profession that if it were taken up a notch, boy, is that a major, major solution to a large, large group of people. Absolutely. We think that there's three major benefits to humanity if those farmers become more productive. First, obviously, that they gain incomes, they become a lot richer, and so we end poverty. If they become more productive, they also produce more food. The product of farming, of course, is food, so we end hunger. And then lastly, again, from this environmental perspective, if we can make our existing lands a lot more productive, we ease the pressure to clear more land and clear-cut forests and savanna. And so from a climate perspective, I actually think productivity is a really big benefit to the environment. Oh, it's a huge deal. Define poor now. We're talking about the poorest of the poor. How would you characterize that? Is there an income cutoff that the UN agrees on? There's a variety of definitions. The most common metric is a dollar a day. So it's a dollar per person per day in terms of income. We tend to serve actually an even poorer cutoff. So our average family earns in the range of 50 cents per person per day. And not all of that's cash, actually. A lot of that's just the value of food produced and consumed. And the human consequences that are really severe. In most of the areas that we work, one in 10 children die before they reach age five. One in 10. And is that generally because of malnourishment? Most cases, roughly half are food related. And then, of course, there's a proximate health disease uh, reason for that mortality. Yeah, well, there's a much higher vulnerability to all kinds of diseases if you're malnourished. Absolutely. Now, let's talk about the people that you serve specifically. What percentage of those children, before they get into the One Acre Fund, are malnourished? 
So the common statistic is in the areas we work, about 40 plus percent of children are permanently stunted from a lifetime of not eating enough. So what that means is that on any metric, like for example, physical height or mental capacity, those 40% of children are two standard deviations below the average in terms wow. of their achievement. Yeah, And that's just from a lifetime of routine meal skipping, uh, not eating, of course, enough nutritious foods as well. It gives you a sense of food being the most basic human need. And there are huge swaths of Earth's population that don't have access to even just this most basic thing. Yeah, and I think a lot of people don't realize, I hadn't until I started reading about it a couple of years ago, how lifelong these impacts are. Clearly, stunting, you're going to be less tall. And we live in a world where people have diverse heights, and that may in and of itself not sound terrible, though nobody would wish the malnourishment that led to stunting on anybody's childhood. But what's more invisible is it shaves off a lot of IQ points. I mean, it really does cause major internal damage that is also lifelong. Absolutely. Children, their minds and bodies are developing every single day. And so failing to feed those minds and bodies is, in my opinion, just morally abhorrent. Yeah, you had a great quote somewhere. You said, every day they fail to eat, they lose a bit of their future. And that is real. And that is chilling. Getting back to this efficiency, there is this one fascinating fact that if farming methods can be improved for this entire group, Africa-wide, worldwide, wow, we're touching 70% of the poorest poor. There's also a compactness to the issue in Africa that surprised me. And you actually talked about it at your first TED Talk. You did a survey of some sort of Africa in 50 by 50 mile blocks. Yeah, you know, we can talk about the scope of the problem and kind of how terrible the state of the world is. And that's something that definitely motivates me. But something that really motivates me is how tractable and solvable these problems are. It makes it more maddening on a certain level. Absolutely, yeah. There's a couple of surprising facts about the tractability of hunger. First is just the basic opportunity here. Again, most of the world's poor are farmers. So most of the world's hungry people, their profession is to grow food. And that's an enormous opportunity. They don't have access to all the tools they require. And so a few little tweaks can make that a lot more effective. Secondly, again, you think about agricultural poverty in Africa. It sounds like the most intractable sounding problem. Africa has a land area that's several times that of the continental United States. But we did you know, this population analysis every 50 mile by 50 mile block on the continent. And we found that the vast majority of Africa's smallholder farmers actually live in a tiny geographic area. If you stacked up all their geographic areas together, they'd make up only about the size of the eastern seaboard of the United States. Wow. So when you think about trying to solve agricultural poverty, which sounds like totally intractable, it actually, given humanity's resources and ingenuity, is a surprisingly doable problem. And where are those points of concentration? Africa's smallholder farmers live in basically three major pockets. So Nigeria is dominant, plus little parts of West Africa around it, Ethiopia, and then what we call the Lake Victoria Basin. It's like six countries that surround Lake Victoria. In all of which you're active in now. Yes, we're active in all of those countries in East Africa together. And also we have a government partnership in Ethiopia. That density indeed makes this a much more tractable problem. And that's what you went back to business school with that on your mind. Let's talk briefly about the people you serve. What is the average household size and the average land holding of the folks that are in the One Acre Fund network? Right. So typically we'll serve a household of maybe six family members, so like a mother, father, and about four children. And then they have about an acre of land about the size of a football field. In the villages that they live in, are there some families that have 10 acres? Is there a major wealth disparity out there? Or is this fairly evenly divided land in these areas? Yeah, in the grand scheme of things, it's pretty uniform. It Um, is. Yeah. And the acre that folks have before coming into the program, roughly what percentage of the family's annual needs does that acre produce? Ultimately, all income in really deeply rural areas comes from farming somehow. So either you're producing crops or you're selling services to someone who has produced crops. So there is quite an active service industry, but pretty much for the most part, all the money ultimately comes from agriculture somehow. And Rwanda and Burundi in particular are two of the most densely populated countries on earth, aren't they? In terms Mm -hmm. of the sheer number of acreage per person. Right. It's not like there's a lot of farmland that's waiting to be occupied. Right. So let's talk briefly about the headwinds that a typical smallholder farmer faces in the part of Africa that you're active in. It's a mix of things, any one of which may not be crippling, but together it's a real challenge. So put yourself in the shoes of a typical smallholder farmer. 
There's three simple things you need to do. You need to access the seed fertilizer and planting practice. So knowledge and inputs. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's a lot of barriers to reaching knowledge and inputs. So for example, on inputs, they are slightly expensive for a family. So a typical family cultivating an acre needs about $80 worth. Of seed and fertilizer for the most part. Yeah. Exactly. Plus a little bit of capital equipment of some kind, a hoe or, Mm -hmm. yeah. And $80 is unfortunately a prohibitively large amount of money for most families. We're really talking about like family scrambling to try to get their next dollar to feed their family for the next day. So you get a sense of $80 being an insurmountable barrier for a lot of people. Secondly, it's not physically available. You might have to take a bus to a regional town or something like that, and you pay a lot of money for the transportation. Then the availability of the products may or may not be available at whatever price is offered, and then you have to cart it all back. Physical availability is a major issue. And then lastly, probably the biggest barrier is the training aspect. There's not a whole lot of inbuilt knowledge about how to farm correctly. And so even after you've invested all this time and money and energy into getting these farm inputs, the average farmer doesn't actually know how to use them properly. And so they see no net improvement in the profitability. When you get out and start doing your extension work and your training work, what are some typical practices that you try to change? The first practice we always start with is composting. So in addition to soil nutrients that are provided by fertilizer, soil structure is critically important for uh, plant success. And a lot of farmers don't fully understand the importance of compost. So the first training we do, for example, is to build a pile of compost about the size of a van. And that is the first basic building block of successful agriculture. Another thing, as you mentioned, is scattering seeds versus planting them very deliberately in a line. And then Fertilizer application is often done incorrectly, again, in a sort of scattershot fashion. So unfortunately, if you apply fertilizer incorrectly, instead of going to the plant, we'll run off into the environment. And so it's much better to do what we call micro doses applied directly to the plant. And so it gets used by the plant instead of running off into the environment. And what form does a training take and how do you deliver it to such a broad number of people? Right. So when we deliver training, we deliver typically in groups of 20 or 30 people. And it's definitely really far from classroom, theoretical, nitrogen cycle type stuff. It's very practical. So we're typically meeting in the field of a farmer. And we like to say that you should get your hands dirty at one of our trainings. So you should actually practice the technique that's being practiced. You, a one acre fund employee. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And the farmer should walk away having demonstrated the activity. And we deliver that through a field network of, you know, our field officers. We have about 3,000 full-time field officers who provide our services within walking distance of the people that we serve. And that's a big deal. I mean, there's some subtleties to the issues that people face. One of the things that struck me in one of our earlier conversations is you said it could cost easily $2 to get to and from the regional city where one might hope to access seed. That is a ton of money when you're living on 50 cents a day per person. So the fact that you bring things into walking distance is a huge deal. And of course, there's the other issue is having made it to that regional city, we've all been to stores here with our incredible supply lines where the thing you want just isn't there. And if the thing you want is particularly good seed or particular hybrid seed, or if it's just something that's in great demand when everybody's planting, that trip can be in vain. And so by bringing both the training and all the inputs into walking distance, that is a bigger deal than most people would appreciate, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. We really believe in that walking distance level availability. So every season we'll send hundreds of 10 ton trucks out into the field and we do these drops for about 200 families at a time, again, in someone's field, and they can then hopefully just walk it back to their farm. The other subtlety I just wanted to point out, because this is, again, something that wouldn't have occurred to me before I started doing research into this, but not only is that $80 hard to get and in many cases out of reach, when it's obtained, it can often be on very punitive financial terms. So that's problem number one. But then also, farmers are both buyers and sellers of food. And so harvest comes around and you have an abundance of food and so do all of your neighbors and the price for the maize or whatever it is that you've grown craters. And that's when you must sell if you're living day to day financially. You don't have a whole lot of choice but to sell at that point when the price is lowest. And then later, the hunger season comes around when harvest is pretty far off. Folks have sold food that they then wish they had, but they had to sell it. And also storage is problematic. And so now you're basically buying back that which you sold at a much higher price, right? Mm -hmm. How violently do those prices swing over the course of a typical growing season? We find that harvest typically sells for about 30% higher during the hunger season, as opposed to if you have to sell it immediately right after harvest. 
to help solve that, we sell these hermetically sealed storage bags, which are basically like a giant Ziploc bag that you can use to store your crops and any insects inside die because it turns out insects require oxygen to survive. And that is, again, it's a subtlety, but it's such an important one because now you don't have to sell that which you will later need to eat. And that has tremendous ramifications because it just simply becomes unaffordable at that stretch time of the year. And you provide financing as well. Yes, we provide all of our services in the form of a loan. So unlike banks, which provide a cash loan to farmers, our loan is actually in the form of physical products delivered within walking distance. That which they're going to would otherwise have to turn around and buy. Absolutely. Yeah. And then farmers then pay us back in cash over time. I imagine you're able to also access scale economies that no smallholder farmer can. Yeah, our purchasing group is very proud to serve and buy with the power of hundreds of thousands of families simultaneously. And so as you point out, we're able to get a better deal on these farm inputs and also quality control and grade them to make sure that they're really the best thing that the farmer can use. Yeah, the quality control is a very, very big deal because, again, I imagine it would be very difficult to tell by eye a high-quality seed, a really great, perfectly tuned hybrid seed for this particular topography from anything else. If I've just taken this murderously expensive ride to this distant city, I'm going to buy what I can get. And so that quality is something that must shift enormously. Absolutely. Yeah, we really believe strongly in quality testing every single product that we deliver to farmers and are pretty rigorous about testing that. And you have a pretty big R&D program too, correct? Mm -hmm. You've got a number of PhDs on staff. Let's talk a little bit about what kind of work they do. Well, smallholder farmers for the longest time have had to use whatever products are available to them, but that's not really necessarily the optimum. Someone living in a mid-altitude region may have to do very different things than someone living in a low-altitude or high-altitude area, for example. Have different practices and also literally have different seeds. Exactly. So our R&D unit takes dozens of different practices and fine-tunes and optimizes them for every area of every country that we work. We'll start off with trial fields where we do hundreds of iterations of different kinds of planting practices and products. Basically A-B testing. Exactly. And then in what we call phase two, we will take 100 farmers that are actual live, real farmers, and they will do A-B tests on their fields, comparing control practice to a test practice. Then we go to phase three, we test with 1,000 farmers. There, we're testing less efficacy and more adoptability and how it fits into people's lives. And then in phase four, we test with 10,000 farmers. And so you're testing things at different altitudes, different longitude and latitude, obviously, different levels of rainfall. How many different packages of seeds, slightly different techniques, mixed fertilizers with your several hundred thousand farmers. Are there five packages? Are there 90? How tuned does it get and how diverse do the final tuned packages get? The package tuning is significant. We probably have dozens of different product configurations that a farmer can buy and practice. We would love to get to a world eventually where we could have hundreds of micro packages and micro fine tuned practice recommendations. But at the moment, it's numbers in the dozens. But that is pretty extraordinary because, again, I'm thinking about the alternative of hopping on a bus and going to a city where certain things are going to be available. Most things aren't. You've got PhDs and tens of thousands of fields you're testing and just nobody can possibly have access to that kind of knowledge on their own. And I imagine that all these tweaks and tunings in package has a significant impact on yield. Absolutely. And that's really the benefit of aggregation is once we're serving a decent critical mass of farmers, we can really spend the time and money to optimize our recommendations for this particular group of 15,000 farmers. We're about to get deeper into how One Acre Fund actually works and how it delivers things. But before we do, I'd just like to talk about the countries that you're active in. So we're active in seven countries. We start in Kenya, then Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, then Uganda, Malawi, and then we have a government partnership in Ethiopia. Uganda and Malawi were just added in 2016, correct? Mm -hmm. Let's go into just a little additional background about Rwanda. I imagine that's where you're serving the greatest percentage of the local population, and it's also where your headquarters are. Could you give us a flash overview of Rwanda's history from 1994 to present? Because everybody heard about what happened in 1994. I think far fewer people are aware of what's happened since then. Yes. So um, Rwanda is best known in America, at least for the genocide. And the country's had a remarkable recovery since then. Economic growth and everything is just in an unbelievable nature. Where you would expect a country after suffering an event like that to just be still completing the doldrums, there's really a dynamism that has infected the country over the last couple of decades. Nonetheless, it's still a very, very, very poor country. And the fundamental constraints about not much land being available for each farmer remain. And so despite all that positive energy, there are significant challenges that remain. And we're very proud to be able to provide some services that help 
in that case, very closely in partnership with the government. And every government is going to be controversial with somebody for some reason. But I would like to point out, having been to Kigali myself and having been around the country a little bit, I was amazed that the social harmony that it seems to exist on the surface, and I imagine it goes much deeper, given that there was this terrible, brutal ethnic war, the government seems to have done an amazing job of exterminating that contagion that drove that. Is that your sense as somebody living on the ground? Yes. No, I absolutely share that sense. There, of course, are lingering you know, all sorts of resentments and things like that from such an extraordinary event. But at the same time, the sense of healing in the country is very palpable and the desire to look forward and move on. The other thing that Rwanda gets applauded for constantly is a very, very, very low level of corruption, which is important. It's all the more important when a country is particularly poor because every dollar really, really needs to serve the people of that country. Absolutely. Yeah. It would be hard to find any kind of endemic corruption. It was astounding to me because we had been traveling all around Tanzania prior to that, where I believe the per capita GDP is something like four times higher. It's substantially higher than in Rwanda. But it was when we got to Rwanda that all the roads were beautifully paved, where the infrastructure just worked in a way that it hadn't in a much wealthier country. And that feels to me that is one of the fruits of lack of corruption. The other thing I'll say about Kigali is it definitely was one of the cleanest and safest cities I've ever set foot in anywhere in the world. There's this really fascinating thing is that once a month on a Saturday, literally everybody in the country gets out and cleans. Yeah. Once a month on a Saturday, like the whole country comes out and does a community project together. Often it's, you know, it's like cleaning up or maintaining a road or something like that. It's extraordinary. Is that a tradition that predated the genocide or is that part of the government's healing program to get everybody working shoulder to shoulder out there? You know, I don't actually know. It is sort of the central hopeful spirit of the country. There really is a national identity there that I really admire. And it's everything from government down to just the average citizen really wanting to build a better Rwanda. So now let's get to how One Acre Fund works, because this sort of group endeavor is central to it. Most of your farmers are in small groups who mutually support each other, correct? Yeah. So in terms of how One Acre Fund works, there's two pieces. Like what's the intervention or the services provided? And then like what's the delivery structure? And so in terms of the services provided, all those barriers we enumerated before, to each barrier, there's a solution and we provide that solution. So lack of credit, we provide credit. Lack of physical access, we deliver. Lack of correct practice, we provide training. For every barrier, we sort of try to provide this extremely simple solution. And then in terms of its delivery, so we deliver it through this network of full-time field officers. And what makes the problem a lot more tractable is organizing farmers into these groups of 10, roughly. And they will do everything ranging from planting together to attending trainings together to being mutually responsible for each other's financial credit. That's a big deal. So if you don't pay back, you're screwing over your nine buddies, in a sense. Right, yeah. The group will then no longer be eligible for credit in the coming year. And that is a practice that's also common in microfinance, correct? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. And your payback rate is extraordinary. Yes. Um, we have a 98.5% on-time repayment rate. And generally speaking, farmers are really willing to roll up their sleeves and help pay for the services provided. Some people might say, these folks are extremely poor. Why don't you deliver these services for free? Part of it is there's only so much money in your organization. And that 98.5% payback means you got a lot more dollars put to work. What percentage of One Acre Fund's annual budget comes back to it through repayments? Most of One Acre Fund is core program delivering all these services. We have other activities, but within that core program, about 70% of our budget is covered by farmer payments and 30% from donors. You're literally serving three times or more as many people as you could if you were a purely charitable organization. What is your philosophy and also the pragmatics of doing this loan payback arrangement as opposed to outright donations? Personally, I'm actually a really big fan of outright donations in an ideal world. 99% of the world's wealth is held by the top half of the world and 1% is held by the bottom. I would love nothing more than to see a massive redistribution of even a tiny fraction of that 99% of wealth. However, unfortunately, not the rest of the world agrees with me always. And so we do have limited resources to accomplish good. Given that, I'm a really big fan of revenue models in the areas of economic development in particular. And so that's why, again, it makes us so much more cost effective, as you pointed out. We can serve three, four times as many people by charging for our services. I think it also makes us a little more beholden as an organization to the customer that we serve. So we use, for example, repayment as a customer service quality metric. In areas where our services are slipping, like maybe we have a bad field officer, for example, you see repayment drop. Farmers stop paying back their loans. And so we can use that as a signal to determine where our services are substandard and uh, we can immediately come in and fix the situation. 
And surely people are going to hold you much more to account if they're paying back as opposed to if they're simply receiving. It's a subtlety, but boy, that's a doozy. They won't just vote with their repayments. You'll hear about it. Right. Customer is king. And we really delight in the fact that the world's poorest people are our customers. And there's a certain dignity associated with that. And you've also made the point that when hunger does come, and it does, there is a certain frustrating inefficiency when you're delivering bags of food as opposed to bags of seed. Seeds are pretty darn compact in an ideal world where inputs could be delivered. I think in international development, we could focus more on cost effectiveness and trying to find the most cost effective solutions to really any problem. And Our long-term hope and goal is to help provide one of the most cost-effective solutions to ending rural poverty. And so anytime we produce an impact, we always measure that against its cost and try to do our best to eliminate as much cost as possible. In addition to the principal services we've talked about, there are some new and additive services. One is that you have become a pretty big distributor of solar lanterns and clean cook stoves, correct? Mm -hmm. Can we talk about the importance of those and why you've decided to distribute those things in particular rather than becoming a sort of Amazon? Because there's probably all kinds of products and services that could be better distributed out there. Yeah, this interesting thing is now we have this great distribution network. We have more than these 3,000 full-time field officers out in the field, each one serving hundreds of farmers. So we have this great distribution vehicle for life-improving products, and we can finance them so that people can afford them. And so it's very tempting to try to sell literally everything under the sun. But what we've done is very carefully and narrowly focused only on products that we believe are the most life-improving. And so solar lanterns are a really great example of that. A family can buy a $25 solar lantern and not having to spend money on kerosene for crappy lanterns, they can recoup that cost within a year. Do you give them one year financing? So in a sense, they literally buy the lantern on a week to week basis with those savings. Exactly. That's great. Yeah. And so they save money in the long run. These lanterns are also 10 times as bright as kerosene lanterns, and we've shown that they lead to increased study hours for children. Yeah. So these are these wonderful life-improving products that are available that are very easy to put through our supply chain. And so on a very targeted basis, we started adding a limited number of products in addition to agricultural products. And the cook stoves are a very big deal from a health standpoint and a safety standpoint, correct? Cook stoves are this win-win for household and environment. So first of all, they save money and time from households that are using wood to cook, which is the vast majority of the households we serve. Because they have to go out and get the wood. Right. And, and, and I imagine areas scarce. are picked pretty clean because yes. everybody's got to go out and do that. No, it can become a multiple hour daily activity. And so cook stoves allow people to use less wood and they essentially save people both time and income. And then it's obviously a win for the environment because most cook stoves use roughly half of the wood required oh, wow. from a regular three stone fire but I believe you're not doing things in the field of water security. Is that because other people are taking care of that well, or is it just you've got to do a finite set of things rather than being Amazon? Yeah, we have to do a finite set of things. And we've also deliberately targeted areas that generally have pretty good water supply. So the lowest hanging fruit in agriculture are people living in ideal growing conditions, literally the tropics with ideal sunlight, temperature, water, et cetera. One thing that surprised me as I read through your annual reports was that trees are a very big part of the crop mix that you're delivering to people. Trees are a surprise to us as well. Is it newish as an initiative? We started doing some research on it like maybe six to eight years ago, but it's only recently started to reach scale. For us, it's part of the philosophy of getting out of poverty. So day-to-day income is very important for alleviating the most harsh conditions of poverty. At the same time, really getting out of poverty requires accumulating meaningful assets. So trees, as a surprise, are a meaningful asset for a farmer. A single tree planted for five cents today can eventually become worth, say, $5 or more uh, when sold as building material. So it's a savings program. It's an excellent savings program. Because it's going to take five years for that thing to turn into building material. Right. Yeah. And if you're looking at education savings in particular, the only meaningful way that people are going to accumulate enough money to send their kids through high school and university, they need to accumulate serious assets. And so trees make a particularly good school savings vehicle, which is a bit of a surprise. So much as a lot of folks in the U.S. might start a college savings program, when a kid is born, you might plant some trees if you're in that situation. Yeah. In fact, our trainings often say if you're planting the stand of 50 trees, identify a specific child and this is their savings account. Oh, really? That's really fun. And also it often is on land that would not otherwise be planted for crops, correct? Like more hilly land. And trees actually take a remarkably small area of land. But as you point out, they can also be planted in marginal areas and also in ways that are synergistic to agriculture. For example, creating a windbreak, which is good for soil retention. And so since this is a new program, you probably haven't gotten to the point of harvesting the lumber yet for any of your farmers, or have you? 
Yeah, some of our early pilot farmers are now harvesting. I, a couple of years ago, visited a farmer who had planted trees that were just five years old. They were several stories tall. She'd harvested a fraction of them to sell in order to pay her daughter's university school fees for the year. It was just this tangible and palpable sense of wealth seen in the form of beautiful trees. When we save here, we don't have that physical connection with the asset that literally we're growing. Yeah. There's got to be something that's just really reassuring if you're in an economically marginal situation and you've been fighting to get out of it, to just every day see these things a little sturdier and a little bit bigger and know that that's going to be a major asset for your family. Think about the satisfaction that a very poor household might experience for the first time, you know, having real assets they can think about in a real future. It's a really important part of hope, you know, and human dignity. So let's talk now about the results that One Acre Fund has had. You started in 2006 with, I believe it was 40 households in your first pilot. Mm -hmm. And how many are you serving today in 2018? So today we directly serve about 750,000 families in our six countries. So that's, and at the average household size of six, that's four and a half million people. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you also have 8,300 staff, correct? It's a pretty labor-intensive operation. So we have currently about uh, 8,000 staff. And what are your objectives for the next couple of year time frame? And where do you see yourself further out, let's say 2030, in terms of households served? You know, we're still growing very rapidly, probably 30 or 40% per year in the years we're resourced properly. By 2030, our general goal is to serve directly about four and a half million households. The important thing is to put into perspective of, we call our market 50 million households in sub-Saharan Africa. And the future of rural poverty and food security in Africa rests in the hands of these 50 million families. We're very excited about trying to reach four and a half million households per year. But at the same time... That's less than 10% of the way to your total goal. Exactly. I've never met an entrepreneur in the world who would be satisfied with serving less than 10% of their problem. And what percentage of the Rwandan smallholder farming population is now affiliated with the program? Yes, in Rwanda, we directly serve about 10% of the population of the country. And then in these wonderful collaborations that we have with government, government is reaching a lot of other people, you know, like 30, 40, 50 plus percent. And you have ways and mechanisms of helping them with training. We have a few ways behind the scenes we're collaborating and pitching in together with government. Now, ultimately, the thing that you deliver to people is greater yields and therefore greater income. What is the typical improvement in yield that a family will get within a year of joining the One Acre Fund? Yeah, so we're very careful to measure our impact. Every year, we physically weigh the harvests of about 10,000 people, so test versus control. And we find on average that on the activities that we support, we're improving profitability by about 50%. 50%. Anybody in the world would like a 50% raise. But when we're talking about folks economically marginal enough that this horrible percentage of kids are malnourished and are taking on lifelong afflictions, that is stunning. And is that 50% enough to basically get them above the threshold of absolute poverty? Getting out of poverty is a complicated concept. What we find is that it's definitely not an overnight solution. So it takes many, many years of increased levels of income and then investing that income and reinvest it into livestock or small business opportunities and things like that. Increasing day-to-day income is just one ingredient and time is the next. It might take decades really to truly get out of poverty, plus the sort of asset accumulation through, for example, trees and things like that. When you put all those pieces together, then there does form a realistic path out of poverty. Unfortunately, it does take time. You have this metric that your annual reports talk about, which is SROI. What is that? Social return on investments. It's a basic measure of how much impact we can generate for every single donor dollar. So for example, in Kenya, if we deploy one donor dollar, we currently believe that we're generating at least $8 in new farmer profits. Wow. Profits. Yes. Wow. We use this measure to allocate our resources most effectively. So if Kenya is producing an eight to one return on donor dollars, then we try to put more resources into that program. What's your average? Our average currently, we think, is about five. Wow. So five dollars of new farm profits generated per donor dollar spent. And Kenya is an outlier. You would put more resources there because it's not like there's any shortage of poor farmers who need your help in any given country. Exactly. Yeah. This is, again, gets to the super efficiency of helping people craft food, which is the thing they need the most to get out of poverty. Because if you were simply delivering aid, by definition, your SROI would have to be less than one. 
Because if you're delivering something that's needed in an area, noble as that is, and I don't want to take away from it, you're going to have overhead, you're going to have transportation, you're going to have all these other things. So the SROI in most organizations, by definition, is sub one, isn't it? Yeah, there's some more subtlety to it, of course, but uh, yeah. essentially, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your philosophy. You are not in Kigali, personally. Your organization is not headquartered in Kigali. It's in Rubengara, did I say correctly? Rubengara, yes. And, and, which is a small regional town. And prior to that, it was in another small regional town, Bungoma. Could you describe what it is like to live in a Rubengara as an expatriate versus Kigali? I'd say the rural life suits me because we're not particularly exciting people. But, you know, <laughs> a lot of agricultural development is the strategies are formed in big cities in the developed world. And we strongly believe in getting as close to the customer as possible that we serve. And so, yes, for the last 12 years, I've lived in rural parts of East Africa where we can really get much more customer intimacy and also just be more immersed in our field operations. And so we have rural headquarters in every country and it's a simple life, but it's really rewarding in that you really get to see the work panning out in front of you. The overwhelming majority of the people that you employ both in the field and also at headquarters are local. If you do make a hire from Europe or the United States, I assume that that is an expertise in some element of financing or maybe agriculture or science. What do those folks end up doing? At our international level, we hire for a wide variety of professions. So there, of course, there's agricultural things like agriculture PhDs and things like that, actually many of whom are from our countries of operation. Yep. And then a lot of it's honestly like boring stuff. It's like accounting and internal controls and software development. And it's all these things that go into building a business and making it scalable. For all of those skill sets, again, we're very proud to try and hire from our countries of operation solely. But when necessary, we'll also broaden the search internationally. And I would imagine that the person who would sign up to live in a rural city as opposed to a capital city in Africa, when you do have to go way outside to do hiring, that's got to be a very different type of person. I would imagine it leads to a very different internal culture from what a lot of NGOs have. Yeah, we're very proud of our rural roots. And I was just talking to this Kenyan software developer who has every employment option available to him. And I was like, well, what do you think about living in a rural area? And he's like, well, you know, there's no traffic. Cost of living is low. They actually, a lot of people really like it. And so yeah. I agree, it does form this unique culture where people are unified by that kind of shared value. I lived in Cairo when I was right out of school. And I was astonished at, frankly, how lavish a lifestyle folks doing NGO work, in other cases, governmental work. You could live a pretty lavish lifestyle in an African capital. And I'm not saying that they were wrongly motivated, but they certainly weren't making the kinds of sacrifices that an expat going to a rural center would make. Getting to a bigger level of philosophy, could you talk about the difference in your mind between transformative philanthropy versus regular philanthropy? Yeah, this is a topic I'm really passionate about because I know a lot of people that run really fantastic organizations and all of us are constrained by resources. And in philanthropy, there's a very incrementalist mindset. So for example, for me, a chance to ask for 1% of my next year's budget is a big opportunity. I will fly from Africa to the United States and back for a chance to ask for 1% of my next year's budget. For a shot on goal, and we all know that not all shots on goal go into the net. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. And you know, that's a fairly typical story. As a result, most organization leaders are spending the vast majority of their time raising money. And because of this incrementalist mindset, we are growing much more slowly than we really could be. If you're trying to pitch in half a percent, one percent here of your budget, the chance to grow is quite limited. I've twice in our organization's history had a completely different experience where philanthropists came in and decided to be transformative. They said, we will make up a double digit percent of your budget for an extended period of time. In both situations, our organization immediately tripled in size. And it's a different kind of philanthropy. It's much more bold. It's risk-taking. It doesn't feel perfectly comfortable, but ultimately has a higher chance of producing much more transformative results. And so can we talk about those two incidents? I know about one of them. What was the first one? The first time something like this happened, we were serving like 4,000 farm families. There was a great philanthropist named Bill Ackman who decided over a five-year period to make up at various stages anywhere from 10 to 25% of our donor budget. And he bet big on one acre fund. And then over that period of time, we grew something in the range of maybe 20x. Wow. That's the power of when you concentrate resources and really make a big bet on an organization. And then let's talk about the second time. So three years ago, a group of six extraordinary families came together and they said to One Acre Fund, for the next five years, for every $2 you raise, we're going to add one more dollar. 
So in other words, a third of our donor budget over the coming five years. And three years into that period, I can tell you that we have, again, tripled in size in terms of total size. We launched two new country operations because it's a very big financial commitment to launch a country operation. We have deepened our programming. So when we were talking about trees, for example, it's a whole new area of programming that we've added. And last year, our farmers planted 8 million surviving trees. Really? Eventually be worth more than $50 million in asset value for those families. Wow. We also invested in infrastructure, all the boring stuff like logistics and finance and accounting that enable long-term growth. And all of these things add up to goodness. And I know this second major transformative round of giving to One Acre Fund was catalyzed by this amazing thing that the folks who run the TED conference recently launched called the Audacious Project. Could you give us a bit of background on that? Yeah, the Audacious Project is an extraordinary group of philanthropists who have come together and said, we don't want to do any more of this incremental philanthropy where it gives scattering around our gifts to a lot of organizations. They still probably do that. And that, of course, is a good thing. I'm not trying to disparage that. But in addition to that, we want to make bolder bets on proven organizations that are ready to reach the next level of scale. We think that to attack humanity's pressing social problems, we need to mobilize real resources against that fight. And so every year they invite, I believe, eight or nine finalists to submit applications for serious tens of millions of dollars kinds of funding. And how did they find you? The Audacious Project has a really wonderful network of linkages to effective nonprofit organizations, partially through their partnership with the Bridgespan Group and, of course, the TED Network. Together, they're able to really scour the planet for really effective organizations. Now they have a public proposal process so anyone can apply. As you know, I'm pretty close to the folks at the Audacious Project, and I'm aware that one of their huge priorities is scalability. They're looking for mature organizations that have the infrastructure in place to handle a major capital infusion. Now, you clearly had a scalable model when you first met Audacious because you'd already grown from 40 farmers to hundreds of thousands. And in prior conversations, you told me that you're sure there are countless other great not-for-profits out there that are equally ready to scale. There are a lot of organizations that could quite operationally feasibly grow 10x in a limited period of time. And in all of these situations, including even today, our organization, the only missing ingredient really is resources. And so philanthropists should absolutely do their homework and look for organizations that are well run. When you visit their offices, they should look like any well run private company like here in Silicon Valley. They should look like they have a well organized accounting department or a customer service call center that hums basically. But when all those pieces are together, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of good organizations that would benefit from a significant infusion in philanthropy and could grow 10x in a limited period of time. Now, of course, in the history of philanthropy, there have been many ginormous gifts. They often result with somebody's name on the wing of a museum or on a library. Is transformative philanthropy in the manner that we're talking about now a relatively newish thing? Transformative philanthropy has been around for a long time, certainly, but in terms of frequency compared to how much money is available, it's really hardly getting started. If you look at the philanthropic capacity of the world, commonly we define a big bet as something that's more than $10 million in gift size. There is the financial capacity for many big bets to be announced every single day. And there's enough scalable organizations out there that could digest these sums as well that have demonstrated this track record of scaling up. But we are far, far short in terms of what's actually happening in humanity, like more than 100x less than our capacity in terms of actually deploying these big bets. So what would you say to a social entrepreneur who's either not yet started out, is thinking about it, somebody who's in the second year of an MBA program maybe, or is working at McKinsey or Bain and thinking that they could do more good for the world? What would your advice be to them, both broadly And also in terms of the scale that they should be thinking of with transformative philanthropy starting to emerge. Yeah, when Anchor Fund, we always believe in realistic boldness. So always within the realm of realism and making sure that we can handle growth, for example, but always pushing the boundaries of what we think could be bold. When someone in the for-profit sector starts a business, they never think, well, my grand scheme is to serve 10% of the market in this. They want to be number one. They want to be serving 100% of that market. And so whenever possible, and whenever it's within the realm of realism, we always stretch ourselves to think about what is the big problem that we're applied against? And what is the biggest role we could possibly play in solving that problem? Would you advise people who want to enter the social sector to do as you did and get the basic managerial and business set of tools as a first step in their career, as opposed to, you know, perhaps going to work for a a very, very large organization that's already in the social sector? 
you know, there's a lot of people who want careers of purpose. And I agree that the first and most important thing is to build career skills. And then the second is to, as quickly as possible, move into the area of passion. I think happily that there's fewer trade-offs required these days. There are a lot of good organizations that are in the social sector that increasingly just have a lot of really excellent career development roles. So fantastic internal training programs and career paths. Yeah. Yeah. And One Acre Fund, I like to say, is one example of that. For every person we hire, we have like a couple hundred applicants. Really? Really fantastic professionals that could easily be working at dot com if they wanted to. Wow. And they're developing their skill sets very rapidly and they get to steadily always stretch and expand their careers. And that's true out in the field as well with the field officers at every level. Yes, yes. That is amazing because when you're picking who you deem to be the best out of hundreds of people, you are simply going to build an extraordinary organization. I can't imagine there are many private businesses in the world that have that selection power. That is really quite amazing. So now we talked about where you might be in 2030. Let's talk really long-term. There are 50 million households in Africa. Is it your super long-term goal to be serving all of them or, or those that are not being serviced adequately by their own governments? We do think a lot about those 50 million hero households that determine Africa's future in terms of food security and poverty, these rural families. And our goal is for every one of those households to be served somehow. So certainly we would like to directly serve as many as possible. Government, I think, gets a bad rap. A lot of African governments are doing really wonderful things for their population. And so whether it be through partnering with us or completely independently, we would like to see those government programs grow to serve greater proportions of that population, as well as companies in the private sector. And so that's why, actually, in addition to providing direct service, we also have pretty exciting partnerships together with government or private sector actors to try to help expand their reach as well. We've already talked about Rwanda, which is regularly cited as a government that does an enormous amount with a relatively small amount of resources. Ethiopia is also particularly good at rural development. Ethiopia has this extraordinary force of full-time farmer trainers. They have somewhere between 40 and 60,000 wow. full-time farmer trainers spread throughout the country, and they're pretty good quality. They're government employees in this case. Exactly. Yeah. And so what a wonderful network for rural development. And so we're very proud to have a limited partnership at the moment in one particular region of Ethiopia, but we think there's a lot of potential to work together with that incredible network. And that was one of the three areas where you cited that smallholder farmers are concentrated. You have a complete footprint in the Central African group of countries. Ethiopia was another region you cited, and the other one was Nigeria, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is Nigeria a long-term goal for you guys? Yes, uh, we just started a small pilot project in Nigeria, but it's a very populous country and it's still very tiny. Oh, it's enormous, yeah. Yeah. So it's a very, very exciting and dynamic market and we're really looking forward to learning more. When you bubble up to the global level, where are the other major concentrations of smallholder farmers that could use their own one acre fund or could perhaps use one acre fund itself if you get another supremely transformative gift? My knowledge drops off pretty rapidly, honestly, as we leave the continent, but classically South Asia, Southeast Asia, some portions remaining of Latin America, there's still large numbers of smallholder farmers. And some of those areas have achieved incredible things in a very short period of time. And some of them still remain lagging behind. Now, one thing about the development paths of the most developed countries is there was a period of time in which very, very high percentage of the poorest of the poor in this country and most of Europe and elsewhere were farmers. And there was a multi-generational migration away from the farm as land has gotten consolidated, as mechanization entered farming, as agribusiness became a huge business. Do you see that being an inevitable part of the future for the region that you're in, not tomorrow, not next year, but over the 20, 30, 40 year time frame. For better or worse, smallholder agriculture will be a basic feature of our world for the foreseeable future. So even as a higher proportion of people move to urban areas, there's a very different population and land dynamic than what happened in North America and Europe. Basically, there's more limited land and much faster population growth. So if anything, the absolute number of smallholder farmers will actually increase in the coming decades and their land sizes are going to become even smaller. So yes, a bigger proportion will move to the cities, but just because of absolute population growth, there will be more and more and more smallholder farmers. There's been in the press some talk about, particularly in Africa, particularly China, starting to buy up pretty significant tracts of land to create large, efficient farms. Are you seeing that phenomenon starting to exert pressure in the parts of Africa that you're operating in? 
a lot of these big land buys occur in areas that are a little less populated, while our operations are more concentrated in more densely populated rural areas. Oh, interesting. So yeah, it's not something that I'm honestly terribly familiar with. What role does technology play in your organization and in your delivery of services? I think people fall into two camps in technology and development, like either technology is stupid or technology is the mother savior of everything. Put a smartphone in everyone's hands and everything is automatically solved. Because then everybody can play Candy Crush whenever they want to. (laughs) Exactly. All the all-important Candy Crush. Yes. We're sort of in the middle. So we do think that technology can serve as a really valuable supplement to in-person training and physical services. So as one example, in Kenya, when we make a loan, it's all done by mobile money. So repayments are made when farmers take their money to a mobile money agent. It's converted to digital form and is remitted to us digitally. And Kenya has got one of the most advanced mobile payment networks in the world, right? M-Pesa? Yep. It's a lot better than the United States. Yeah. When I was there, you could do everything with a phone and it just felt so much smarter and so much more efficient. And particularly for unbanked people to be able to get money from point A to point B, that's a big deal. It's pretty incredible. And is technology any critical part of your training? Do you bring videos out in the field? It would be hard if it was the day of cathode ray tubes and VCRs. We're just now starting to incorporate more tablets uh, throughout our field force, and there's an opportunity to share some video training. Generally speaking, though, infrastructure is low enough that even brick phone penetration is not very high in many of the countries we operate. And so the ability to deliver video through, for example, smartphones is still very limited. If I listen to Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk and others, I will come under the impression that there probably will be a smartphone with pretty darn good connectivity in all of the poorest quarters of the world within middling to large single digit number of years. And I don't think they're just being wide eyed optimists. There's very serious plans to deliver broadband globally and phones just simply get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. If that future ensues, would that change anything fundamentally for you? Actually, I think penetration could happen a little more slowly than that in these rural parts of sub-Saharan Africa. Unfortunately, the fundamental barrier is like a smartphone is probably never going to get cheaper than like, say, $30 or $40. It's a prohibitive amount of money for most people. So people are often surprised at actually how low phone penetration is. That said, I mean, power to anyone who's trying to improve connectivity. And there's myriad ways where we can't even imagine really what the impacts are going to be. And there's also plenty of ways where we think that could enhance service delivery. The ability to push trainings out to individual phones or the ability to provide updated market information and things like that could be beneficial. At the same time, I am still a believer in human-to-human contact, particularly when we're talking about something that's really core to someone's basic livelihood. The richness of information, the trust that's conveyed by a human being is very difficult to completely supplant with just a mobile phone. And it generally sounds like you are very tech light. Is there any reason why you couldn't be delivering what you're delivering now if it was 1978? We basically use technology whenever possible and whenever infrastructure allows. Yeah. And so there's a lot of things that make service delivery a lot better thanks to technology, just the existence of databases. But indeed, I think we could operate in a very low-tech environment if needed. You could operate in 1978. Not that I'm suggesting you do that. It'd be very difficult, actually. And I'm a <laughs> science fiction writer. But this service could have been delivered decades ago. It is theoretically possible, yes. So you've shared some advice for budding social entrepreneurs. What would you like to suggest to any philanthropists who might be listening? I'd like to suggest just like a few tactical things for philanthropists. First is, I think more philanthropists should have the bold goal of seeing their wealth decline over time. So philanthropists are also very good at growing their wealth. I think it actually is surprisingly difficult to actually make your wealth go in the opposite direction. Once you have a certain amount. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. I would find it very easy, but I, when you're talking <laughs> about people who have that level of capital that's accruing and earning returns and so forth, yeah. Right, right. And I think it's a goal that more people should consider as part of their life and something they should work to achieve. And then, of course, the question comes, how do I actually spend that money while still being responsible about it? And one practice I've seen a great philanthropist do is to take a meeting every month with a different organization leader. They're just in learning mode. They set expectations appropriately, but they just do that once a month. It's pretty time efficient. And then they fund some of those organizations to get to know them. The last thing I would suggest is when you really get to know an organization over a number of years and all the pieces are there, bet big. Yeah. I think more and more philanthropists should think about what does it mean if I add a zero or two to what I was normally thinking of giving? How could I work with that organization to totally transform what they could accomplish? I guess one of the hardest things, if I put myself in their position, would be finding that scalable organization. In the private sector, private companies are notorious for drowning when they get an extra large round of financing or they go public, just being unable to process 
the inbound capital. And I would imagine that's one of the biggest points of resistance, particularly for somebody who hasn't been operating in the social sector. Most of these folks have made their money in business, obviously. How would you suggest they go about finding that scalable opportunity? So I think the monthly meetings are a good way to start in that it's super time efficient and you have an organization in, they give a 10 minute pitch, you just ask them a bunch of questions. And then maybe out of 10 of those, three or four of them strike you as really good. And you sort of pull the thread a little bit and those organizations generally know other good organizations and et cetera, et cetera. I do believe in not just right out of the gates giving $10 million, like get to know them over a number of years and out of the pool of 10 organizations someone funds, maybe a few really strike a chord. Yeah. And have a plan that could actually digest that right. large slug of capital. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. the point where I think more and more people should be having this conversation. What would you do if I could give you X amount of money? What would be your plan? Show me a plausible plan for producing 5X growth over a number of years. Is that effectively what Audacious asked you? Exactly. Yes. Was that kind of a surprise? I mean, you weren't exactly drowning in money. Was that in some ways the first time you really considered that? Did that sort of throw you for a loop initially? Yeah, we're still not drowning in money, I'd say. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a very unusual thing. As nonprofit leaders, we're conditioned to think in a very incremental fashion. I'm trying to fill my budget. In fact, this last week, I've been really focused on trying to fill my donor budget for the next year for kind of survival purposes. It's very, very, very rare to be allowed to dream big. Yeah. Yeah. And it's an extraordinary opportunity. And I really believe more philanthropists should be creating those opportunities. Well, there is an interesting feedback loop because if more and more philanthropists are posing that question 10 times a year to different people, if it's hundreds or thousands of people who are doing that, then suddenly everybody in your position is going to have that in the back of their mind because they're going to be asked that every so often. And when that is constantly churning in the back of your mind, your answers to that are going to become more refined, more powerful, more audacious. It's a good thing for the world if more social change leaders are allowed to dream. Yeah. And again, we're conditioned over many years not to, to yeah. think incrementally. And if we are allowed to dream a little bit more... And you're asked that question on a regular basis. Absolutely. It's yeah. a virtuous cycle. Yeah. We are capable of achieving a much better world if we put our minds to it. Well, I know that your time here in the United States is limited, and I appreciate you're coming up from Daily City, so I don't want to detain you any longer. But thank you for the incredible work that you're doing. Actually, tell folks if they want to support. I know they could give you $10 million, and everybody who's in that position, I urge you to do that. But for the rest of us, what is the best way to support your work right now? Currently, it costs us about in the range of 30 or $40 dollars to serve a family for a year and to start a family down that transformative path out of poverty. And so it's as simple as going to our website. And that URL is? www.oneacrefund.org. And it's spelled O-N-E. It's not the number one. Right. Well, again, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. And much as I'd love to keep you here for hours and talk, more than most people, even the folks that I talk to, there's a lot of good works that depend on every hour of your time being available to you for other purposes. So thank you so much for coming up to San Francisco. Thanks. I love the show and I appreciate your having me on. So that was an unusual episode for the show on some obvious levels, but on most of the important ones, it wasn't. Our guest was a brilliant founder with an amazing track record who's greatly impacting the world by using carefully selected elements of both science and technology, partly by doing that, in regions where they're urgently needed. I'd be really interested to know if you'd like to occasionally hear from some other great social entrepreneurs like Andrew. Please tweet at me or send me a message through my website if you have a strong opinion either way. And by the way, I apologize that I'm nowhere near as good as I should be about replying to my inbound messages, but I do read each and every one of them, and I sometimes actually reply to things months after they first arrive. My lousy track record in this regard is a result of the pace necessary to keep up with this demanding podcast, along with other creative projects that do a bit more to pay the bills, including the two exciting ones I told you about at the start of this episode. Now for some really good news and a bit of bad news. The bad news is we've come to the part of the show in which, rather than pummeling you with annoying ads, I ask you to please consider supporting this work on Patreon while attempting to lure you into doing just this with yet another piece of rather fun exclusive content. That's the bad news. But the great news is I'm happy to say this show is now past the break-even point due entirely to the generosity of my existing 800 and something patrons. 
Indeed, I'm now making slightly more than New York City minimum wage from the hours that I put into it. Regular listeners will know that minimum wage had been my somewhat playful goal for June 30th, and I was significantly short of that goal when the day came around. But then suddenly, in July, I hit it. So thank you to all my backers on Patreon. Of course, New York City minimum wage doesn't really pay my bills, nor does it put me in a position to hire any help, which could allow me to do two things. First, it could enable me to expand my programming beyond two episodes a month, which I would love to do. Secondly, a little delegation could reduce my personal work hours to something that would be sustainable over a period of years rather than just months. So please do consider backing the show at patreon.com slash Rob Reed. Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And my last name is R-E-I-D. So patreon.com slash Rob Reed. The upside is that at a level of $5 a month or more, you'll unlock many hours of bonus material, which by definition, you'll really like if you're a fan of this show. Every time I post a new episode, I also post something to my Patreon feed. That bonus material is often connected to the day's main episode, but sometimes it's completely unrelated. And this is one of those times. Since I'm such an obsessive reader, people are always asking me for book recommendations. So in this Patreon episode, I talk in detail about several books that truly help shape the lens through which I view my life, the world, and or literature. If you're able to support the show at a level of $5 a month or more, I hope you'll listen and perhaps come to love at least one of these books as much as I do. But to reiterate something you've heard me say before, truly any level of support is meaningful. I profoundly appreciate those who can't afford $5 yet still back my work with a smaller amount. Precisely because that doesn't unlock all those extra hours of programming, it sends a resounding signal of appreciation, which I do hear loud and clear. So thank you. And of course, I also appreciate the profoundly generous people who donate more than $5, even though I'm unable to offer any additional benefits in exchange for that. A growing handful of folks are indeed backing this show with $50, $100, and in two astounding cases, $200 a month. I will respect their privacy by refraining from calling them out, but they know who they are, I know who they are, and my gratitude is immense. Seriously, that level of belief in my work is hugely validating, and that really helps me stick with it. Speaking of supporting things, after our recorded conversation, Andrew and I continued to talk for a bit, and he told me that One Acre Fund is coming up a bit short on its fundraising goals for this year, short enough that they may need to contract their operations for the first time in their history. I was devastated to hear this, and I'm doing what I can within my own means to help out. If you are inspired by Andrew's mission and the work of One Acre Fund, I encourage you to consider helping out as well. As Andrew mentioned during our interview, anyone can donate any amount simply by going to their website at oneacrefund.org. One is spelled out, so it's O-N-E and not the number. And if, like me, you're slightly dyslexic about the spelling of acre, it's A-C-R-E, so oneacrefund.org. Thanks so much for listening. As I indicated back in June, August is sadly a one-episode month for this podcast series, but I have two truly amazing interviews coming up in September, then two equally amazing ones in October, and I do hope you'll join me for all of them. 